Hello, Global Gardeners. We've got people already checking in from all over the planet. We've got Cherry Pie from Cape Town. Tony O'Neill has checked in from England. It's always good to have Tony O'Neill from the Simplify Gardening Channel here. And we have a lot of very frigid Americans checking in from all over the United States. It is cold, cold, cold for many of us. I've actually warmed up quite a bit. Right now, it's about six degrees in my garden. That's uh, minus 14 degrees Celsius, and this is the warmest it's been in almost two days. We got down to minus 15 degrees overnight, uh, which is very, very cold. That's uh, minus 26 Celsius. So I've had cold weather, but I know most of the country is having cold weather too. Overworked gardener checked in from Texas with four degrees Fahrenheit. That's minus 15 degrees Celsius, which is very unusual for Texas. That's the equivalent of about a 7B hardiness zone, but I'm guessing that in that part of Texas, you're probably more used to being in an 8 as far as your hardiness zone. So for some of us, it's exactly where our hardiness zone says we should be. For my hardiness zone, 5B, that means on average, our lowest temperature in the winter is minus 15 degrees. And that's what I hit last night. It's probably not going to get colder than that for the rest of the winter. And so I'm spot on for the historical data for what my hardiness zone is supposed to be. But there are many areas of the country where it is cold, cold, cold. I talked to my son this morning from outside Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and that whole part of the state is essentially shut down. Ides are, uh, roads are icy, highways are closed, and they've got snow, which is very unusual in Louisiana, especially during the time of Mardi Gras. So if you're cold, stay warm. Today we're going to be talking about seedling care, transplanting, hardening off, a lot of things that do take into account the weather. So we'll try to tie all this together. It's so great to see everybody checking in and lots of experts here to help answer your questions. I'll do the best that I can. Jay and Heidi are here and Tony from Simplified Gardening. So throw your questions out as we move forward. I do want to point out some great information that was being passed back and forth. Suffolk Shepherd commented about using a cordless hand vacuum to get rid of Japanese beetles. And often when I'm asked the question, how do you deal with different insects? Uh, I'll say hand pick if you don't want to use be, uh, chemicals but the vacuum cleaner is a great idea so throw that out there i've seen that i actually have never done it but if you have an infestation get out there with your hand vac and suck up those insects it's a great way to even get some of the eggs that might be left behind on the leaves so thanks for throwing out that piece of information i think that was a great way to start the day and marge gray wolf uh, also had a great tip. If you're drilling holes in plastic, like plastic totes, particularly the hard plastic totes, if you use a step drill, which is actually a drill with a couple different sizes built into it, you're less likely to crack the plastic. And it can be difficult if you use just a standard wood drill. First off, you're probably going to slide across the surface and scar it as you're trying to grab the hole. But for those hard plastic totes, it's really easy to crack if you just use a standard drill. So I love that idea of using a step drill. Thanks so much for that. And I want to say hello. I noticed uh, Karen Colson checking in from Warner Robins, Georgia. There's a uh, air base there, one of the few air bases that I never landed at when I was in the Air Force. I flew all over the, the United States and many parts of the world, but Warner Robins was never one of those places that I ever made it to. So welcome here today. It's so good to see all the rest checking in. A lot of the regulars, um, Dwayne is saying, sorry that the Arctic air went down south. Uh, appreciate your concern. There's no control we have over it, but it is some frigid Arctic conditions, especially for regions like Texas and Louisiana that are not used to this cold. <clears throat> so it'll be interesting to see, particularly on YouTube. I, I have no doubt a number of the gardening channels that you probably watch 
will be doing videos within the next week about the damage they sustained as a part of this storm. Last year when I had that massive hailstorm, I did a video that showed the damage in my garden. And I, I suspect a lot of other gardeners on YouTube will be doing the same because it's one of those things that happens. But you have to know that it happens and it happens to all of us at some point or another. So you just have to bounce back, recover, and figure out what you're going to do to save your garden the next time. Uh, Chris is saying the darn groundhog was right. Um, spring is on the way. It's just a question of how soon it's going to get here. And for many of us, it can't come a moment too soon. If you look behind me, this is what my garden looks like this morning. Had a little bit of snow none of it has started melting yet just because it's too darn cold but not a lot of snow a little bit of snow but i'm ready to start working outside as much as we can jamie newton thank you for that and you're welcome i love doing the live feed on mondays love answering questions you say you're having problems with the ice and saving plants and so that's a good point jamie and it's not necessarily too late but but here's an issue that many of us in the frozen north have learned to deal with in our gardens when we get the snow and ice and those of you that might be in the south and the first time you've got snow and ice you're not sure how to deal with it and so you want to get out there and knock off the ice from your plants don't do that if you've got ice on your plants leave the ice on the plants it it may damage the plant if it's a plant that that doesn't like freezing conditions you'll have some cellular damage but if you try to knock off the ice you're more likely to break branches and you're more likely to cause some pretty severe damage to the plants by trying to knock it off shake it off break it off instead just leave the ice on the plant and if you think about it ice has a temperature of zero degrees celsius or 32 degrees fahrenheit and that's a pretty steady temperature if you if you look at some of the studies that are done that layer between the ice and the plant is actually slightly above the point of freezing and that's why i say snow is such a great insulator ice can be a great insulator too though plants that are going to have damage below those temperatures like a frost at say 36 degrees Fahrenheit or two to three degrees Celsius there'll be some cellular damage on those plants that like the warm weather but when you have ice form or snow form the temperature's not going to get below that freezing temperature and so if you just allow the ice and snow to stay on your plants and then melt your plants are essentially being insulated from the colder air and so using Texas as an example with that four degrees with ice on your plant your plant is being exposed to 32 degrees Fahrenheit not four degrees Fahrenheit and so leave the ice on until the Sun comes out let the ice melt that water will drip down into the soil and and benefit the plant but if you try to knock off any of the, those severe conditions you're really setting yourself up for damage and so that's why when you look at the picture of my garden behind me i'm i'm not doing anything out there i'm just going to let it melt i'm not making any effort to deal with the snow and ice we've just learned in the north and the cold areas you just let it be and the sun will come out it'll melt and then you'll be fully recovered then you go out and check on what kind of damage you might have sustained as a result of a severe storm like this but just relax stay inside have a cup of coffee and stay warm torches and pitchforks thank you so much for that contribution that super chat i'm in the northeast this time of year i'm always chomping at the bit to get started am i the only one no you're not i actually uh, lived up in northern maine for four years and we were chomping at the bit all year round waiting for that one week of summer that tended to come sometime in late June or early July. And like I said earlier, when I began uh, the, the live stream today, I'm anxious for spring myself. So you are not the only one. There are many, many of us that are waiting to get outside, but that's why we do things like starting our seeds indoors. I've got seeds started, they're growing, they're green, 
And even though it looks like this behind me outside, I'm still getting a little bit of that gardening itch taken care of because I'm growing seeds indoors. So we'll talk more about that as we move through the day. But that's how you, that's how you scratch the itch. Uh, that's how I scratch the itch, is by starting seeds indoors weeks before I can put those plants outside. And then as the weather warms, and then as I can get out, and I can work in the beds and all the rest, um, it becomes much, much more enjoyable, which is what most of us really want to do anyway, is get outside and do all that work. So um, let's see. Yeah, Tony's saying gardening is a 24-7, 365 task. Great way to put it, Tony. Just because it's cold out, just because it's freezing, just because you're waiting for spring, you can still do gardening activities indoors, outdoors. I I was out this uh, this weekend, as cold as it was, and I was dumping some of my kitchen scraps on my compost pile. I have a cool pile that uh, gets pretty close or mostly frozen during the winter, and I still go out and add material to my building compost pile even when this when it's this cold outside so there's still lots of gardening activities that you can be doing even when you can't get out and dig in the soil and put plants in place Dwayne saying i remember in april of 2018 alberta had winter spring fall and summer all in the same month um, i do not doubt it there was one year let's see it would have been um, about 32 years ago my daughter was very young. We lived in way northern Mon or Maine, way northern Maine, and we got one of those little wading pools, those kids' wading pools. And we waited and waited and waited so that we could fill that pool with water, and our young daughter could go out and play in her little swimming pool. And that was pretty much what our weather was like that year. It was winter, 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 spring for about a week or two. We had two days of summer. The first day was essentially the day that the water in that little pool warmed up. The second day of summer, she got in the pool. And then it seemed like fall came within just a couple days after that. And so in that, that year when she was a toddler, she got to play in her wading pool one time because of just the crazy weather that we'll often get in the frozen north. So um, I fully understand Alberta would have similar conditions. Let's hope it's better this year. Jenny Simon saying, I'm busy reading the Fruit Gardener's Bible. It's a great book. I have it. I love it. I think it's on my recommended list that I have in uh, the link in the description um, that I think you recommended. So I can take care of my apple trees, elderberry, raspberries, and what else have I got? Oh, grapes. That is awesome. That's a great way to start. I also highly recommend currants. And so those of you that are that are in the UK in particular, you're probably pretty familiar with currants. Here in the United States, currants are one of those fruits that, that we often are not even aware of. We haven't seen them. Very few of us are growing them in the garden. You can't buy currants in any supermarket in the United States. I've never seen fresh currants in a supermarket. I think I've only seen dried currants once in like a health food store. But that's one of my favorite plants. So add that to your list, Jenny. I would suggest currants. I have, let's see, I think I've got 10 currant bushes that I put in this last year. And I think I just ordered four more that I'm going to put around my fruit trees to start developing a, a food forest. And so a uh, great selection of fruits. I've got all those as well. I'll be adding some new elderberries this year. And in addition, uh, I'm putting the elderberries in my front yard. Most of my other fruits are in the backyard. But I even have currant bushes in my front yard as decorative bushes. And at some point here, uh, maybe this year, probably closer to next year, but I'm going to be doing a video on how you can create an edible landscape. And so my front yard that is seen by the public will become an edible landscape with many, many beautiful plants, including currants. So throw currants onto your list. Good morning, Garden Dilemma. Good to see you here. It's so nice to have everybody that's that's checking in, that's been here a while, a lot of new people as well. And uh, I think it's just one of those things that it's Mondays is just such a special day because we can all get together. Jay Dixon says, I grow currants, time consuming to sort. I'll agree with that. Dennis Miller says, I love currants. Uh, so here, here's a, one of the reasons I really encourage currants. So at the school garden, I was growing 
as many different types of fruits as I could. And when it came time for the fruits to be ready to harvest, I'd get the kids out and I'd just set them free and they could harvest whatever fruits they would want. And so we would have strawberries and raspberries and currants that would be fruiting at the same time. And when the kids were let loose in the garden, almost invariably, they went straight for the currant bushes. They bypassed the strawberries and the raspberries to be the first ones to harvest the currants because they loved the taste of the currants so much. So we just don't know that in the United States, which is why I, I think it's a, fa a fascinating plant for we Americans to grow because you might be the first one in your community to have a currant bush. And when you grow it, it can be just so exciting, especially for kids. It does. It can be time consuming with the, some of the pruning requirements and the sorting requirements. And, and as my bushes get bigger, I'll be doing videos on that, but it's just such a wonderful plant. Pat Patrick, good to see you back this Monday. Thank you for that super chat. How long do my homegrown worm castings remain viable? Uh, so from a nutrient perspective, they'll remain viable uh, until you put them in potting soil and put them in your garden. One of the benefits that isn't often talked about when it comes to worm castings is the microbial action within those castings. All of those bacteria that are in the soil, that are in the worm guts, those are very beneficial. And so over time, those bacteria will die. So if you're storing your worm castings and allowing it to dry out, then the bacteria won't be viable, but the nutrients will be. And so you can store your worm castings in a plastic tote. That's what I use to try to keep them moist. Uh, you probably won't see, I, I haven't had any mold development on the castings that I'm saving in the plastic totes until I can use them. But as long as they stay moist so that that bacteria can stay alive, it's viable for months. I've got castings that have been in my totes for two or three months now, and I'll be adding it to potting soil here very soon as I transplant my seedlings. And it, it's, it's all completely viable. So I would say try to use it within three to six months for best results, but uh, it, it should be able to stay viable beyond that point. I'm, I'm not making so much in the way of worm castings that I have to worry about saving it for that long. But if you do, uh, just put it in a container where it can stay moist and it should be fine. Mama Cass is saying, I'm so confused about seed starting. There's so much conflicting info about when to start. I've seen your videos on seed starting, but what if the info is not on the seed packaging? Great question. And I actually um, have that video programmed for the first week of March, I think it is, where I'm going to talk about seed packets and what I think are the best seed packages because there are many including baker creek i love baker creek their catalog is wonderful they've got some really unique seeds but their seed packages just don't have the information that many of us would like them to have and there's a lot of other companies park is that way too park seed is great but their seed packages just don't have a lot of information on them and so if you have looked at a catalog and ordered something with a picture that you saw online and then the seed packet comes and it doesn't have the information, you've got to look it up. And in most cases, that information will be on that company's website. So Baker Creek does have information on when to start seeds, how to start the seeds, transplanting, but you have to go to their website and you have to dig a little bit to find that information. And the same with a lot of those other companies that are selling great seeds, but just not putting the information on the seed package. You've got to take that extra step. And that's why I'm going to do this video with some of the companies that I recommend that have great seed packages like Botanical Interest that has just a ton of information on the outside and literally on the inside of the seed packages to make sure you have everything you need. But I'm sorry to say, you just got to take that extra step and try to get the information. And as I mentioned recently, I think I, it was in a video and on a live stream in the last couple of weeks where I talked about when you're preparing to do your seeds, do a review of the seed package. If the information is not on it, 
then take that step of finding out the information before you get out in the garden or get down with your pots ready to go and then you read the seed packet and realize the, realize the information isn't there. Go ahead and read the seed package first, see what information is lacking, go online to get your answers, then you can start your seeds and that, that tends to make it a little bit easier. But especially if you do like, like I've shown in the videos where I sit down with my calendar and I fill out the calendar, that's a perfect opportunity. If you t pick up your seed package and you're trying to fill out the dates on your calendar when you're going to start those seeds and you don't see where it says that you start six to eight weeks before your last frost date or whatever, well, that's the point that you now take the time to do the research and find the information that you're missing out on. Uh, and so Doris Miller, I actually um, had written this down and I saw that Jay had answered you as well. Any tip to keep little white worms off of white blackberry bushes we have on the homestead? Um, so as Jay suggested, I would recommend that you try to identify the insect before you just automatically assume it's a bad insect that you need to remove. If it is a bad insect, like we talked at the beginning, you could actually take a hand back out and suck up all those little white worms. But it, it could be the larval stage of an insect that you want in your garden. So you may wanna take a little bit of time to try to identify what those white worms are, what the larva is and what it's going to turn into. Cause it might turn into a moth, a butterfly, a lacewing. There's all kinds of things that, that those little bugs that we see on our plants will turn into. And those adults are insects we might want to attract to the garden. So do take a little bit of time, try to identify them in the larval, <coughs> excuse, in the larval stage. If not, Go ahead and suck up or pick off or spray off as many as you can and then try to identify them as an adult. Often it's easier to identify the adult insect rather than the larval insect. But we get back to my basic philosophy that I've, I've shared many, many times, which is to try and develop an overall environment where all the insects and all the animals are working in balance. And so if you've got a bunch of white worms on your wild blackberries, there is some insect in your region, a native insect that will eat those worms. That's just the way nature works is you've got this balance where if you've got a pest, there is an insect or a bird or some other animal that will be eating those insects. And so if you automatically get rid of all of those insects you're assuming are bad, you might also be get, getting rid of that other insect that will be looking for food. And so they're used to coming to that wild blackberry patch to eat those larvae. Now those larvae are gone. Well, now they're going to go to someone else's garden and you could be creating an additional problem with some other type of pest. And so aphids for instance when i was at the school garden and we would have aphids in the greenhouse i would do some control on the aphids but for the most part i just let the aphids go because i knew within a two-week period the ladybugs would show up and as soon as the ladybugs showed up they would start eating the aphids once they were done with the aphids now a lot of those other harmful pests that are starting to to hatch and grow in that secondary period, well, the ladybugs are already there and they've already laid their eggs. And now the ladybug larvae, which are voracious eaters of some of those pests and those pest eggs, now they're in place for that secondary uh, infestation that you might be getting in your garden. So when you get in balance, aphids bring ladybugs and then ladybugs stand guard for the rest of the season. And that's why I don't do a lot of control when I see some of those pests. So I wouldn't worry too much about it unless you're noticing damage to your plants. It may just be one of those kind of things that, that you, you think it's a problem and it really isn't a problem. But work on identification and that might help. Mama Cass, thank you so much for that super sticker. I appreciate the contribution. And Tone Loki, thank you for that super chat. As I upgrade seedlings into larger containers, should I continue to use the seedling soil or do I change the soil types as the plant grows? And thank you for asking that question because that was one of the things I wanted to talk about today. 
was seedlings and seedling care. And so when I show, I have a video on how to make seed starting mix and how to make a uh, planting mix. And I've got videos recently on your considerations when you're starting seeds. At some point, those seeds will turn into a seedling and then they become a plant. And so my approach is to use a seed starter mix, which is a light, fluffy mix with good drainage. It holds some water, but there's no nutrient value in it whatsoever. So that the seed can grow, the roots can grow freely, and then, and this is the critical point, I transplant those seedlings from those cell trays into another pot. And in that new pot or that new container, that's when I'm using a potting soil blend. And that potting soil blend includes compost, worm castings, maybe a very light fertilizer, but it's got nutrients for those seedlings to grow. So to answer your specific question, no, I don't use the seedling soil in those next steps other than the seedling soil that is surrounding the roots because I'll take out that entire cell with that seedling soil then transplant it into another container. That new container is filled with the potting soil and I'll just drop the, the seedling with that initial seedling mix into the new container. So now as the roots expand, they're moving from that seed starter mix that's surrounding the roots initially, and they're moving into a more nutrient-rich soil. And when I say soil, it's technically soil-less because it's all organic material. I use peat and compost and perlite and vermiculite and worm castings. When I'm using the worm castings and the compost, I typically do not add fertilizer. If, I'm, if I don't have that nutrient-rich compost uh, or worm castings, then I'll, I'll typically add some blood meal and some bone meal and some green sand. That's what I show in that video. But I found over the years that a lot of those, those fertilizers really aren't necessary for most of the seedlings that we're growing. And what I mean by that is when we're starting seeds indoors, I'm operating under the assumption that I'm growing these seedlings with the intent of moving them out into my vegetable garden, usually within the six to eight week time period. And so they're not going to be big feeders as far as fertilizer is concerned. The nutrients that are in that soil that I've made, or you can buy soil that has all the same ingredients, that's all they're going to need. And then when I put them into the garden, now I've got nutrient rich soil in my garden. And so they can move from that potting soil right into the soil that's in my bed and continue their growth. And so this is another one of those great things that, that I highly encourage. Go to your nursery, go to the garden center and read the back of one of those bags of potting soil and you'll see what the ingredients are. And that's why I make my own because when you look at a bag of miracle Grow potting soil, chances are it's going to have peat and or cocoa core. It's going to have compost. It's going to have perlite. It's probably going to have some slow release fertilizers. And if you pay more for like a Fox Farms variety, it's going to have worm castings in it. That's why I make my own. I just take the same ingredients that these big companies are using and blend it myself. And you can save a ton of money when you buy or make the ingredients and blend it yourself. But as far as the seedlings are concerned, yes, in that second step, they need a more nutrient rich environment. And then you grow it just like any other plant. You don't have to worry about having a cover on it anymore. You don't have to worry about that higher humidity that so that the seeds will germinate. You just work to keep that potting soil mix evenly moist. And one of the best ways to do this, I talked about it briefly in the video where I had the, the seed starting tips, is to water from below. And this might be a new concept, especially if you're a new gardener. But the idea is if you've got a bunch of these little pots with these seedlings, put these pots in a tray of some type 
And then when you water, pour the water into the tray so that the water is absorbed from the bottom of the pot. And so when you're using one of these potting soil mixes that have coco coir or peat moss, through capillary action, they're going to absorb that water that is at the bottom. And that will help keep that pot and those the seedlings with that evenly moist condition. And then as the roots grow down, they'll be growing down toward the source of water. Too often, and I've been guilty of this many times over the years, if you only water your young seedlings that are in pots from above, from the top, you're going to pour your, your watering can around the pots and you're going to, to wet the soil. But you might only be wetting the top half inch or maybe the top inch of soil. And when I was growing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of plants at the school, it was often easier, particularly when we were out in, in the greenhouse or an open setting, to water from above. And if you don't water deep enough, what happens is the top half of that pot is nice and moist and the bottom half dries out. And so the roots are not going to grow into that dry, hard packed soil. They're going to stay on top where you're watering and you might not get very good root development because you might have a whole bunch of shallow roots because you're only watering from above and you're only keeping a, a small portion of that pot moist. So pour the water into the pan or pour it into the tray and then allow that water to be drawn up into the pot and you're much more likely to get better root development. So I wanted to throw that out at you. Gerald St. Augustine's asking, how do I prevent the seed shells from sticking to the leaves, which often kills my seedlings? Um, good question. And so you'll often see this. I see this a lot um, on, on peppers and squashes in particular, where as the those initial leaves are, are pulling themselves out of the seed, the seed will like get stuck behind and the leaves will stay stuck to those um, shells the outer layer of that seed. Often you can just give it a day. And as if the plant grows a little bit bigger, it should grow out of that seed. But if not, I get down there and I've used tweezers. I use my fingers, but I'll grab the seed shell and then gently pull the leaves out of it or try to coax the plant out of it. Because sometimes the plant will be deformed because it'll actually be bent inside that seed depending on what type of seed it is. Uh, but that's how I do it. I just physically separate the plant from the seed when I see that the seed is interfering with the plant's growth. Most of the time it's successful and you might tear or damage those leaves but that's okay. Once the plant is free from that shell, it's going to grow and those initial leaves are going to fall off eventually anyway. So I wouldn't worry too much about the seed damage, but, but hold it by the leaves. Do not grab it by the stem. It is so easy to damage the stem of young seedlings. And at any point during transplanting or a, a, a maneuver like this, avoid holding on to that young stem because you're much more likely to damage and kill the plant if you hold it by the stem whereas the leaves are pretty tough and you can hold these plants by the the leaves and, the, and they'll be fine okay let's see what else we have popping up jennifer saying um so i used boiling water in my seed starting soil let it cool off a bit added young onion seeds to it they germinated in three days awesome and my jalapeno too i don't use a heat mat either awesome yeah that boiling water can actually warm up the soil to the point that at least for the first couple days, you might get the equivalent um, results as a heat mat because it's a warmer seed starting mix. So glad to hear it. Glad you're having success with that. Lilia is asking, what seeds are best to start in peat pellets? I feel they were too dense for onion seed. Uh, I, I do start onion seeds in a flat with open soil mainly because just I sow a bunch of onion seeds and they're really easy to separate when they're growing in a, a soil mix. So I would agree with you that a lot of those kind of plants don't do as well in the, the peat. But other than that, I, I start almost everything from peat if I'm using peat pellets. Uh, I, I, I do a lot of tomatoes in peat pellets. I do peppers in peat pellets. I do a lot 
of perennial flowers in peat pellets. And, and one of the, the reasons I do that is because peat pellets are really easy to just pull out of the tray once that seedling is, is starting to grow and then pop it into a bigger plant. For, for some of the plants that I'm starting, uh, like the onions, that I know at some point I will be separating those plants apart from each other because they're little seeds and it's hard to get exact spacing, that's when I'll grow in an open flat of soil because I know I'm going to be separating those plants and it's easier to separate in an open flat as opposed to the peat pellets. But other than that, uh, I start almost everything in peat pellets if I've got the peat pellets and want to use it. But especially like the flowers where I'm, so like for for instance tomatoes i'll go from a peat pellet or a a cell one of those 72 cells in a tray and then i'll move my tomatoes into a three inch pot and then a couple weeks later i'll move them from that three inch pot to a six inch pot because the tomatoes will develop roots along the stem and so i try to transplant tomatoes as many times as I can to get that additional root development. But for something like the perennial flowers, I'll start in a peat pellet and then go directly into a six inch pot and bypass that intermediate size. And that's one reason why I like the peat pellets because it's real easy to just pull out the pellet and stick it into the new pot and then put that pot under the lights. So I, I would just say experiment a little bit, try, try some in each and figure out which you like best and uh, that might help you in the future. I, I like making my own mix and I like using the, the trays. And so I'm getting away from peat pellets just because peat pellets are an additional purchase and I can make my soil mix cheaper than buying the peat pellets. But if you're using peat pellets, use it for just about everything and, and you'll be doing fine. Okay, um, good question. Gardalim is asking, do you remove the cloth around the peat pellets before transplanting? And yes, and I'm, I'm planning on showing this on a video soon where I'm showing, I'll show you this process because I've just started some seeds and they've just started growing and I'm not at that point yet to transplant to a bigger pot. But yes, I will separate out. I, I'm, I might not remove that mesh that's around the, the peat pellet, but I will tear it from the bottom and the top to try to give extra room for those roots to grow. Even though many of these peat pellet companies like Jiffy will say that these are biodegradable coverings around the peat pellets, if they are biodegradable, they take years and years to break down. And so not only do they take a long time to break down out in your garden, but some of them are strong enough, especially for those finer roots that might be trying to grow. Some of them have diff difficulty growing through that mesh. And so, yes, that's one reason I use my utility knife. And you might have seen, I've got a couple videos where I talk about my favorite tools and gardening gifts for gardeners. And in those videos, one of my favorite tools is utility knife. And that's one way I use the utility knife. I have it in my pocket and when it comes time to transplant, I just use the knife to make some slits in that mesh around the peat pellet and that's how I separate it to then put it into another container. So great question. Uh, you don't have to do it, especially for bigger plants that will have bigger roots, but I have found it a little better success if you can break up that mesh covering around the peat pellets. So, okay. Uh, yes, Rob's allotment and gardening uh, says they take around three years to break down. And and I would agree with that. I, ha I haven't seen studies on that and I haven't really tested it myself, but but that sounds appropriate. I've, I've gone definitely the next season to transplant and found some of that mesh from the previous year. So it, it takes a while to break down. Um, okay, let's see what we have. Um, Nick from Yuma is asking, can I trust burpees concentrated seed starting mix bricks? I haven't used those. I think those are the ones that, that are using the, the cocoa core as the primary ingredient and they should be okay. I, I saw something recently, it might've been an ad on, a, on the burpee site that I was on recently and you have to add water and allow those bricks to expand 
and then you plant in them. I would look at the ingredients because it could be nothing more than the core, uh, the cocoa core. And that's suitable for starting seeds, but beyond that initial growth of the, the, the seedling, it's not gonna be any nutrients at all. And so you would need to definitely transplant to another mix that has some nutrients. But uh, I can't speak specifically to, to that brick as to if they have any other amendments in it and any other nutrients added to it. So that would be the only caveat I would, I would say is to check to see what else is in that brick and whether it's only suitable for seeds and seed starting or if it is also suitable for growing seedlings in that secondary phase. But uh, if any of you have used that, go ahead and help out by throwing an answer to that question as well. Isabel, Isabel, thank you for that super chat contribution. I can only transplant mid-June. What a bummer. Uh, I, that's, that's pretty much what I'm at. I'd, I'd, even though my last frost date is officially May 18th, I wait until June 1st to do any of my transplanting and outdoor seed sowing for the vegetable garden. And especially for the peppers, I, I hold off the peppers as long as possible so that my garden soil is as warm as possible for those chilies. And I'm doing the same thing. I do much of my pepper transplanting in early to mid-June. So sorry to hear that. That's just one of those things that some of us gardeners have to deal with. So uh, that yet another reason to have all your transplants ready to go from your seeds starting indoors. Uh, when you do put them outside, they're nice and robust and ready to go. <clears throat> um, Nick for, from Yuma is saying it's 100. So I'm guessing it's 100%. So it's probably, um, it, it's just, yeah, Elena's saying the thing. It's just the core. And so it, it's great for germination. It is. It's a. It's that nice, loose material that once it's hydrated, it holds the material, and it's great for seed germination, but you can't grow the seedlings in it for more than that very brief period. Once they start setting their true leaves, you'll need to transplant out of that brick material into a secondary material like potting soil. So great. Thanks for that, that assistance there on that. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, let's see what else we have. Joe Black is saying to Hardy... Heidi, all serious gardeners should make their own soil. It takes years to get just the right mix. Yeah, and, and so good point, Joe, because the video I made that shows how I make my seed starter mix and potting soil mix, I think that video is almost three years old now. And I still follow the same basic recipe, but I'm still tweaking it. I still am doing new things like adding the worm castings. I I do not show adding worm castings in that video, but now I'm adding worm castings to my mix. And depending on what I grow, this is one of those things where it gets a little more um, technical and you got to get the experience. It's depending on what the, the seedling is, I may use more perlite or vermiculite if I want more drainage, or I'll use more of the peat moss if I want it to retain more of that moisture. So great point. As you become a better gardener, modify, first off, yes, make your own soil because that's the best way to really figure out what works. But then feel free. It's okay to modify your mix over time until you find something that works well. And so that video that I did all those years ago, that was the mix that I had developed over years and that was the potting soil mix that I grew thousands and thousands of plants in over the five seasons at the school garden. And that's why I know it works for me because I had great success with all those plants. It might not be best for you, which is why the, mo the modification that Joe recommends or suggests is a good idea. So I, I second that, that notion. Um, Chris is asking for any tips on Brussels sprouts. Um, I don't have any particular tips. They are very difficult to grow here. I tried them once and they didn't do well. I'm going to try them again. I'll talk more about that at the end today when we get to the philosophy phase. But, uh, but no, I really don't have any great tips on Brussels sprouts. So those of you that, that are in the warmer areas that have tried Brussels sprouts and had success, go ahead and, and share that information with Chris. It, it could help. Um, okay, let's see. Um, yeah, Lena's saying, 
um, based on what I had mentioned that to, to Nick. Once you get true leaves, you need to use potting soil. And so for, for the new gardeners out there that might not understand how the seedlings work, I'll just spend a little bit of time on this. The very first leaves that come out of the seed, the cotyledon leaves, are not true. And, and so this is, this is another fascinating thing why I like to grow different seeds. You'll have a whole bunch of different plants. And when they first sprout from the seed, they all look alike because those cotyledon leaves pretty much all look alike. And the purpose of those first leaves are to start sucking up the light. The photosynthesis then sends energy to the plant, the roots grow, and it sends up the rest of the plant to start its life. And so it's the next set of leaves that we call the true leaves. So the first leaves, they're just leaves. They're not true to the plant. But that second set of leaves are the first set of true leaves. And they will have a very distinctive shape. And so while the seedling of a pepper and a tomato look very similar, once they set their true leaves, the tomato leaves look like tomato leaves and the pepper leaves look like pepper leaves. And it's at that point, after that first set of true leaves has developed, and as or shortly after the second set of true leaves are forming, that's when I'll move from the peat pellet to the potting mix, or that's when I'll move from the, the tray and I'll pull the plant out of the cell and move it into a, a different media medium like the potting soil. So um, you, you wait until those true leaves are established because not only do you see the leaves and you know the plant is growing, but those leaves also correspond to root development. So you're not going to have ample root development of that seedling until you see those true leaves are developing. And now with that root development, the plant will be ready for transplanting. So that's that's the tip that I've talked about before. And, and that's what we're referencing here is waiting for the real leaves to show up before you, you start thinking about transplanting. So Jean-Pierre, good to see you here today. Bonjour. I was planning to use pure compost in my seed trays. Is that okay? I have a problem to use cocoa or peat since I saw a video of my cocoa versus peat. Um, I would say yes, but I would use like a sifted compost. And so the, the whole idea and, and why the, the core and the peat work so well is because it's a really light material that the roots can really grow through easily. And so, yes, you can definitely start seeds in compost, but most of the compost that, that we buy, at least here in the United States, or that we make tends to have chunky pieces to it. It tends to be a little bit denser, especially when it's moist, it tends to be denser than a peat or a core. So I would say, yes, you can use compost, but I would use uh, a sieve or some type of sifter to get rid of those big chunky pieces. And I would also add perlite or vermiculite because compost by itself, because it's decomposed material, it's going to be very small particles. It's going to hold a lot of water and that density might be might not be enough for the root development. But if you blend in perlite or vermiculite, now you're adding some of that drainage so it's not too wet. And now you're loosening up that compost so that the roots can grow. And so you'll often see that in seed starter mixes where it might be 50% of a peat or a core and 50% perlite. I would suggest the same thing like compost, and then 30 to 50% perlite. And I think you would have better success using that as an alternative to the core or the, the peat. And compost is, is definitely a great way to go. So yes, good idea. Twisted Goat, what's up Gardner Scott? What's up Twisted Goat? Just found you and I'm actually at the kitchen table in Northern Georgia starting some seeds. Come on spring. Well, welcome to the channel. Good to have you here today. And I'm, I'm glad you're starting your seeds. I'm going to try to get a few extra started this afternoon. 
and uh, this is a great time to do it. It's it's definitely cold in all areas. I'm guessing you've got the cold conditions in Georgia as well, uh, or possibly rain. I saw that Paul in Florida had mentioned a lot of steady rain over the recent days. So um, the, these cooler, colder days of winter, just a great time for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere to be inside starting seeds. And and I will throw out, because I wanted to, to share with this for those of you in Cape Town and, and on the other side of the planet, it's okay to be starting seeds right now too. So one of the reasons I've, I'm spending so much time talking about seeds is for most of us in the Northern Hemisphere, we're starting seeds to put into our summer garden. But if you haven't seen my series on the fall garden and how to plan for your fall garden, I would suggest you take a look at it if you're in the middle of your summer right now, because you can be starting seeds in summer with the intent of transplanting them outside for a fall garden. And a lot of these same issues of starting the seeds and the seedlings for those of us in the winter hold true for the summer as well. So if you haven't thought about a fall garden, if you're in the middle of your summer right now, start thinking about a fall garden. And that might include starting some seeds indoors. So yet another way to expand the season. So uh, Maya Lanello Spazio, I hope that was that was close. Um, I does the same rule apply to green onions? I have just moved mine to a more nutrient dense medium, and now I'm thinking that it was too early. They grew up to four inches. Uh, yeah, the same basic idea will will hold true with onions. I'll typically start my onions because they're in an open tray. I will typically start them in a potting soil mix rather than a seed starter mix so that I don't have to worry about that secondary transplanting. Uh, but yes, the same basic idea holds true. If you're starting onions in a, a seed starting mix, you will need to transplant them into a bigger mix. And three to four inches is probably about the point that you'll be moving them. Now, the, the leaves are still going to be there. They're not going to you know look at all like the pepper leaves or the tomato leaves, but you'll be able to identify that an onion is developing a true set of leaves. Those secondary leaves that are growing after the first one are going to be the true leaves. And so an onion falls into that monocot where it's going to send up that initial single leaf, but after that, all those leaves that develop are, are, are the leaves that are true to the plant. And as long as those are in place, then you can start transplanting. Onions are very durable. That's why most of us that grow onions will go to the nursery and buy a set of, of onions that already have the little bulbs and they might only be six inches tall and they're all dried out. And then we put them in our garden and hydrate them and they grow into onions. So you can do the same thing, regardless of how you're starting your onions from seed. They're, they're tough, tough plants, and I wouldn't worry too much about being too early or too late with your onions. They, they'll they probably recover with very little problems. They're just such wonderful, tough plants. So, uh, hey, Jay, thanks for that link to the Gardener's God channel. I appreciate that. Um, it's always nice to have you here and spreading the information. That's wonderful. Uh, Torches and Pitchfork is saying, got to be careful with dry soil at high concentrations of silicon. Uh, yeah, dry soil, it, it, it's, it, if you can avoid dry soil, whether seed starting, seedling growing, or out in your garden, you'll have better success all the way around. And so whether it be silicon issues, salt issues, nutrient issues, pest issues, your plants will do better in a moist soil. So um, I'm not sure exactly what the reference was there, but avoiding the dry soil is definitely something you should try to do. Okay, uh, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, the hardening off because for some of us, we're just starting to put our seeds and think about the spring and the summer growing. But I know many of you have been growing your seeds and seedlings for a while. And it really got me thinking, particularly with this cold snap in the United States, how many gardeners out there in Georgia and Louisiana and Texas are at that point where they're getting ready to put their plants outside. And then you've got a snap like this 
where record-setting temperatures are going to be taking place in many parts of the United States today and tonight. And how does that impact your gardening plan, particularly with those plants that you started indoors and now you want to move them outdoors? And so I've got a couple videos on my channel I would recommend you watch as far as learning how to harden off your plants. And so with that link that Jay just shared, you can go to the Gardener's Gone channel. And then on that channel, do a search of hardening off and, and you'll find a, a, a few different videos. I show you the whole process. But the, the basic concept is you've got your seeds growing indoors and now you need to put them outside. Indoors, they've had this nice, wonderful environment. It's a steady temperature, 24 hours a day. The lights are perfect because you have them set up and they're on timers. And now you're gonna move them outside and the outside conditions are not the same as you have indoors. So you need a gradual period of time for them to get used to the outdoor conditions. That's hardening off. And so typically the first day we'll put them outside in a sheltered area where we just kind of say, hello plant, this is what the outside looks like. And then we bring them indoors. And over the period of about a week, every day we expose them to more and more outside time, more sunlight, more wind, more of those conditions that they're going to experience when they get out into the garden. And that's what I show in those videos. But now the question arises, what happens if you're getting ready to harden off or you've actually started the hardening off process and you suddenly have a cold snap like this where over the course of days, the temperatures are close to freezing or below freezing? And the answer to this is you stop hardening off. Bring those plants back indoors, put them under the lights that they were growing in or by the window where they were growing before you started hardening them off and leave them inside. Do not even attempt to continue the hardening process, hardening off process when the conditions are as severe as they are in a storm like this. And so I've had to do that too. I, I That's why I say, the hardening off process is usually a week or you should plan for a week. But in my region, it's, I, I have to keep up with the weather forecast. And if I have a really nice warm week in May, mid-May, late May or early June, which is when I'm usually doing most of my hardening off, and the forecast is calling for a cold night or a couple days of colder weather, well then I just bring the plants back inside and I've lost a couple days of my hardening off process. Now, I may have to start over again, depending on how long a period of time that is, but at least it's it's been a break in the hardening off process. And it's not unusual for some of us to take two weeks to harden off our plants until the conditions are just right in the garden and the future forecast after transplanting is good enough for the plant to survive. So. If you've started hardening off or you're thinking about hardening off, wait until the conditions are good on a regular basis to put them outside. And it's okay if the, if the process gets disrupted and you have to start over again. It's better to keep the plants alive. It's better to keep them growing indoors than to think that, oh man, I started hardening off, the plants are outside. Oh well, it's gonna be a freezing night. I guess they're going to die. And I know some gardeners that think once they start hardening off, they can't back off. I'm telling you, it's okay to back off and you can start the process over again if you have to. And you also have to think about the soil temperature. So those of you in Texas right now with four degrees, if you were planning on putting your plants out anytime in the next couple of weeks, I would be careful. I would get out there in my garden, even after it warms up again, and put a thermometer in the soil to see what the soil temperature is. Because this cold has been so severe that your soil temperature has dropped dramatically. And even when it warms back up again over this next week, your soil is going to take longer to get back up to the temperatures that they were at just a week ago. So you might have to slow things down in your, your planning as far as when the plants are gonna go outside based on weird, once in a century storms like we're having this weekend and it's okay it's okay to slow down your process i'm a big proponent of planning 
and getting your calendar out and having the idea of when you're going to put seeds in the ground. But if your weather is not cooperating, just slide the calendar, just slide your plan a week or two, just so you have better success in your garden. Okay. Um, let's see what we have. Um, square deal tot um, or squared eel tot. I wonder what that is. That's that's a creative name. I'll have to work on that. Which veg should you not use perlite with? Um, that's an interesting question. And so the the purpose of perlite is to improve the drainage of the soil, the seed starter mix or the uh, the the potting soil mix. And so I use perlite in both of my mixes because I want drainage. Now, when I mentioned earlier, as far as modifying the soil, if you're growing a plant that really likes a wet, wet environment, then you would lessen the amount of perlite so that that soil stays wet. There aren't a lot of veg that fall into that category. So I'm trying to think of some veg that has to stay wet and nothing is really coming to mind. So even a small percentage of perlite is going to keep the soil from becoming saturated. And that's what we're really trying to avoid with these seedlings. If the soil is saturated, then you can run into issues where that little seedling is going to rot because it's just resting in water. There's not enough oxygen in the soil for the roots. Roots need oxygen. And that's why the perlite is there. So you can choose to reduce the amount of perlite if you like a moister soil. Or like, for instance, if you're traveling and you're going to be away from your home for a few days on a regular basis, you might want to use a mix with less perlite so that the soil stays moister for two or three days. So instead of watering your seedlings every day, you can get by with watering your seedlings every two or three days. I could see that as a reason to reduce the amount of perlite. But as far as a type of plant that reduce, that really, that needs less, uh, I really can't think of one. So uh, if you have an answer, if there's something you know of for a plant that doesn't want any perlite, um, post it on the, on the chat here. But um, yeah, yeah, Maria is saying celery. That's one reason why I don't grow celery is because it likes a wet condition. Um, but that's more so when the plant is growing. I'm not sure that the, the seedlings would benefit from a saturated potting mix. But uh, uh, yeah, Lane, Lane is saying the same thing. That, that would be the only one that, that off the top of my head um, wants that much. And Tony's saying the same thing. Celery is a bog plant. Okay, there you go. So... Um, Take some of the perlite out of the mix if you're growing celery, and uh, appreciate that input. But uh, pretty much everything, and and that's a good point. I don't grow celery, and everything I grow, I have perlite in. So I appreciate that input as far as the the wet condition. Thanks for that. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Yeah, Mama Cass is saying she loves the Simplified Gardening Channel, as do I. And Tony's had some really good videos that he's put out in the last couple weeks as well. So definitely need to check that out. Okay. Um, one of the other things I want to talk about is transplanting. So we've talked about the seeds. We've talked about the seedlings. We've talked about hardening them off. And then I just want to close the loop by talking a little bit about transplanting. And that's why I mentioned the soil temperature as being something that you need to check. In my region of Colorado, it is not unusual for very cold temperatures in May and the soil just doesn't warm up. And then suddenly the end of May, beginning of June, the days are nice and warm. And so getting back to what we talked about earlier, where there are times I don't transplant to the middle of June, just like some of you. The reason for that is primarily because of the soil temperature. Just because the outside air temperature is warm, just because the nighttime temperatures are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius, which I use as a decision point for putting out my tomatoes and peppers and squashes and all those warm season plants. I wait until I have the nighttime temperatures that are warm enough because usually when the nighttime temperatures are above 50 Fahrenheit, 10 Celsius, 
the soil temperature is okay for most plants. But a lot of it depends on how hot your days are and how long you've had those hot days. Because the soil will start, will start to cool off a little bit at night and then warm up more during the day and then cool off at night and then warm up. And that's the cycle that we need to have over a period of weeks before we transplant outside. And so ideally for pepper plants, for those chilies, for those eggplants, ideally you want a soil temperature at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, about 20 degrees Celsius for best results. Because if you put your plants into a warm soil, they're gonna take off, they're happy, they're going to grow. But if you put your plants into soil, it's just 10 degrees Fahrenheit cooler at 60 degrees Fahrenheit or, or 16 degrees Celsius, they're going to be much slower to grow. It's a bit of a shock because they've been growing in a nice indoor environment, they've been hardened off. Now you're putting it, them into cool soil and they're gonna be uh, a little bit stressed. They're stressed by the transplanting process and now they're stressed by the fact that their soil is cool. So take that into consideration. One of the things I like to do, especially if the weather is cooperating and I can actually get ahead of my, my plan and my calendar, if you put a plastic covering over your bed, you can put a tarp on the ground, you could put hoops with plastic over it, but that's one of those ways. If you're ready to transplant, you're getting close to that time and the soil just isn't warming up because the nights are too cool or it's been cloudy and rainy, you can get out there and, and make it an artificial heater for your soil. Cover it with plastic. That will retain a lot of the heat during the night so it won't cool off as dramatically. And during the day, it'll warm up the soil faster as well. So if you find that you're getting close to that time when you want to transplant and the weather just isn't right, throw in some of those tricks. Cover the beds. Use that plastic. Use a cloche. A cloche is a, a French term for a glass bottle with no bottom that you put over your plants. I do the same thing with plastic gallon milk jugs where I cut the bottle, bottom off and then put that in the spot where I'm going to put the plant. It's a little mini greenhouse. It warms up the soil. And so what I'll often do is put that cloche in place for a couple days, let that soil warm up, then you remove the cloche Put your little plant in the ground and then put the cloche back on top of it and you really give your plants a good jump start because they're starting to grow in a nice warm soil and a nice warm air environment that, that the plants, those particular plants like peppers are really looking for. So start thinking about that now. Even when it's cold and snowy and you're just starting seeds, start looking into some of these ideas for transplanting, which may be just a couple weeks away for some of you, maybe a couple months away for some of the rest of us, but now's the time to start thinking about it. It's never too early to think about putting your plants in the ground, even before the plants have even started. If you understand that part of the process, now it moves so smoothly. And that's why so many of us that have been doing this for a while have better success because we know when to start our seeds. We know what medium to use for our seed starting and then our potting. And then we know how to harden off and we know the appropriate time to transplant. And then the plants are growing in our garden and, and, and people that don't know how to garden look and go, wow, you've got a green thumb. You must be magic. Well, no, it's not a green thumb. There's nothing magic about it. It's just learning this basic process and then putting all the pieces in play at the appropriate time and the plants are going to do better. It, it's, it's just that simple. If you put a, a plant into a happy spot, you're going to have a happy plant. And so think about that now. If you don't know enough, I have some videos on this. Tony's got videos on this. There's a lot of information out there that can educate you before you need to put your plants in the ground, uh, like tomatoes. I've got videos on how to transplant tomatoes, both indoors and then outdoors, different videos. But you can look at those videos now, and long before you even start your tomato seeds, you'll know 
the entire process that you're going to follow for best results. So there's there's a suggestion at you. Hopefully it'll work to your advantage. Nancy Denker Hong is saying success certainly feels magical, doesn't it? But really, when you break down that magic, it's just doing a couple steps at the right time in the right way and you've created magic so but it does feel really good it does definitely feel magical when you get everything right richard robin robbins is asking is a special th soil thermometer needed to measure soil temp or will any thermometer work just about any thermometer will work it should have a probe it should be a probe thermometer so that you can actually stick it into the soil if you look at some of the videos I did, again, about three years ago, that I shot at the Galileo Garden at the, the school that I was, was working in and planting trees and plants, there's one of the videos where I talk about soil temperature and transplanting. And I'm using a turkey thermometer in that video. And it's just one of those dual prong 12-inch uh, thermometers that are made to stick into a turkey to see what the internal meat temperature is. I, I used that for years and years in my garden. Uh, in the, the video that I just did where I show the, the temperature of the seed starter mix, that's a meat thermometer. And it's a digital meat thermometer that I just stuck into my, my uh, potting mix to see what the temperature was. And I do have a soil slash compost thermometer that I have used when I was doing the video last year. I showed about the different temperatures in metal beds and wood beds on that video. That was a soil compost thermometer. But other than that one, which I, I bought relatively recently, I've always just used meat thermometers to measure my soil temperature. And they're very accurate. As long as you can push it into the soil, three inches or so so you can see what the temperature is where the roots are going to be growing yeah yeah any thermometer is fine uh, if you got it in your kitchen and you and your significant other don't mind you taking it out and sticking it in the soil go ahead and go for it and you can also buy them uh, so cheaply anymore get yourself a little digital meat probe and use that as your garden soil thermometer and dedicate it for that purpose throw it in your your, your garden toolbox, and then it's already always there. And, and I will admit, I don't do enough of that, and it, I think that's actually a good idea. I'll, I'll check my soil temperature before I transplant in a couple different beds just to be sure. But particularly if you've got microclimates in your region or in your garden where you, and they might get extra shade or extra sun, it's actually a good idea to have a thermometer in your garden tool bag and before you transplant go ahead and check out that bed to see if the soil temperature has reached the point that that it's ready for transplanting so I don't do that often enough but it's a great suggestion if you want to add that to your bag of tricks go ahead and consider doing it uh, okay let's see Matthew is saying um, thanks for saying Celsius degrees also I'm well I'm glad you appreciate that to make this as beneficial as possible we really are a global audience and so i really am trying to help all of you out from france and the uk and and south africa and australia and all the, the other places that i know many of you are watching from and i'm also learning too i try not to be that conceited american who thinks our way is always the best way we we use fahrenheit on our temperature scale and it's difficult for us because that's what we were taught in school. And this the Celsius, just like for you, Fahrenheit is confusing. For us, Celsius is confusing. So that's why I've got this, this sheet right in front of me. That's how I can convert so easily. I always have this sheet in front of me, and this is what I use on my videos so that I can do that conversion. And I'm gradually learning that's why I know 50 degrees Fahrenheit is 10 degrees Celsius, because I use that number a lot. And little by little, I'm, I'm, I'm learning more and more about Celsius because most of the world does that. And so uh, I apologize when I don't make that conversion because I have a very large global audience, but I will try to do it. And, and I appreciate you saying you appreciate it. And it's okay for you to correct me on those days when I get it wrong or don't do it right, because 
I will admit I've gotten it wrong in a couple of my videos where I, I didn't do the right calculations in some of the metric conversion, and I apologize that as well. Um, creations from within. Trisha, thank you, Gardner Scott. Do you have a video on the temperature of what our soil should be before transplanting? I don't have a specific video on that yet. Um, much of what I was just talking about, I am planning a video when I transplant out in the garden, and sadly, it will be a little bit late for many of you who will have already uh, put your plants in the ground. But I, but I will be creating a, vi a video where I talk about the different plants. I'll show how I measure the soil temperature and those considerations. So no, I don't have that video yet. But there's a, there's a lot of information out there. And you can just do some simple searches for whatever plants you're going to grow and add soil temperature. So if you do a search for instance, soil temperature for transplanting tomatoes, no doubt you'll come across some good lists that will, that will identify appropriate soil temperatures for different plants because I know that information is out there and I reference it as well. So hopefully that will get you at least headed in the right direction, but, but a video is coming. So you might not be able to use it this year, but you can use it next year. Okay. Moved North Homestead. Hello to you from frozen Missouri. There are so many of us that are frozen. So before I forget, I am traveling next week. I'm, I'm traveling down to Louisiana to see my son and his family. So I will not be on this live stream next Monday. So that's Monday, February 22nd. I will not have a live stream, but I will be back the week after that on February. Um, actually, I guess that's March 1st. So on March 1st, on that Monday, I'll be back for the 50th live stream since I started doing these last year. So hopefully we'll have a, a nice episode with lots of great information for our 50th. I'm trying to think of some exciting things to add to that live stream, but that, that'll be in two weeks. I will not be back this next week. So I'll, I'll be posting that on the, the Facebook page. I'll be posting that on the community page on the Gardner Scott channel. If you're watching right now, you hear, you heard it here first. If you're watching here on replay, sorry, but I won't be back next Monday. So don't bother showing up. Um, well, you're, fi you're free to show up actually. Um, but I won't be here and there won't be a live stream to show up for. You can show up on the Facebook page and chat there if, if you want to get your Monday gardening fix. But uh, yes, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Heidi. Heidi, I'm hoping for a safe trip. I'm heading out tomorrow and uh, hopefully the roads will have been cleared a little bit. But that's why I brought it up with the, the reference to Missouri, because right now I'm planning to go down into New Mexico but if the roads and the weather don't work right, I may have to go through Kansas and possibly into Missouri to drop down into Louisiana. So I've got to take a look at the weather and see what happens. But thank you for that. Uh, and thank you, Nick from Yuma. Appreciate it. Garden Dilemma. I am looking forward to a vacation. It, it's, it's difficult for those of us that are making videos on a regular basis. I and mean, it really is hard for me to take time off uh, because I want to keep making the videos and I want to keep doing the live stream and I almost have to force myself to take a vacation like this. I've already got the video done that'll be showing up next week and I'll still be on the the channel and trying to answer questions and I'll still be trying to participate remotely as much as possible. Uh, but it is hard because I really do love doing this and I love seeing you all on Mondays and all the other times that you're commenting on on videos and chats and so uh, it 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 kind of hurts a little bit to move away, and it's also at that point. One reason I'm doing it this next week is because I'm a little early for starting seeds, and so I can come back from this trip and then go full bore, dive in head first to all my seed starting, and that's why I've got it planned for this week. And and so my future vacations will also probably like you have to be programmed around the the plants growing and the seed starting and 
if you're really passionate about gardening like some of us, it's hard to take a vacation because often the seeds and the plants will suffer when we're away. But I've got my granddaughters that are going to be watching the few seeds I've already started and they'll be taking care of the seedlings I have. So I'll probably report back on that because my, my granddaughters are, this is their first chance to help Poppy out with the seed starting. I think that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Uh, MacGyverland Gardening says, open a page for next week's video that says no stream this week. Um, that's a good idea. And uh, we'll come and chat in the sideline anyway. That's a really good idea. Uh, so look for that. Yeah, I'll I'll create um, basically the same thing. Um, it'll be a live stream like this. And actually, let's see. So I'll be, I might be able to do that too. So so that, that's a good suggestion. I'll go ahead and plan uh, to, to start a live stream like this, the same type of thing for next Monday. I know many of you will get on beforehand and start some of the chat. And I might actually be able to join you briefly um, as part of that, and then I'll then I'll be on the road because I'll be traveling next next Monday. Um, so that's a great suggestion. Uh, yeah, look for that. I'll go ahead and and that'll be the title of the the video or the or next week's live stream will be no stream this week. But if you click on it on Monday at the normal time, you'll still have the opportunity to say hello to each other, maybe ask a few questions maybe share some of what you're doing and I may or may not be able to join you but if I can um, I'll definitely do that so great suggestion that's awesome uh, Nachi G saying we appreciate me thank you so much Nachi family first enjoy your trip and be safe we'll be waiting for you and and I'll be anxious to get back as well and uh, yeah Chris says I need a co-host I have thought about that and I may do that at some point in the future uh, I had my daughter on a month, two months ago now probably, as a co-host on the live stream. And that's not a bad idea when I do um, some of the, the travels. Maybe we can set up a co-host. Uh, maybe Tony might be involved or Scott Head. Yeah, that's not a bad idea to, to just keep the flow going, keep the information happening. I like that idea. In Hosticum, hey Scott, hey to you. Have you ever grown any kind of mushrooms? And if so, what kind and how did you do? I haven't, this question has been asked recently and I've just this week started doing some research as to um, what type of, of mushrooms and I've been waiting for this trip. Um, my plan is to go ahead and order while I'm on this trip so that hopefully I'll get my mushroom kit when I get back and then I'll start mushrooms. But I've been looking at oyster mushrooms and a few others. There's some different kinds of kits and I wanna try different kits. And so some of the mushroom kits are logs and you drill the holes in the logs and then you take the little dowels that are inoculated with the spores and you stick those into the holes you drilled and then you grow mushrooms. I want to try that system. And then there are other systems where you, they basically give you a big um, block of compost material, some type of, of woody, probably peat-based block, and the spores are there that you inoculate the block with and grow mushrooms that way. And so I, I like to grow mushrooms like that too. So no, I haven't done it yet, but I am planning to do it here in just the next couple of weeks and I'll be filming the process. And then after I get mushrooms, I'll release a video at some point in the months ahead. So it's coming. Can't can't specifically answer as to which mushrooms I'm going to grow yet and how they did, but it's coming. So um, thank you for that idea. Karen, thank you for that sentiment. I appreciate it. Um, plan on taking it very, very slow. My route will take me through Dallas, Texas. And for those of you in the United States, you might have seen on the news last week that horrendous pile up in Dallas. And so I'm going to be taking it very slow, very easy. I'm used to driving in snow and ice. And so I know to take it slow and I will not be in a rush at all if I encounter any conditions that are hazardous. I've, I've am old and safe enough. I'll pull off and get a hotel if that's what it takes. But I uh, appreciate that sentiment. It, it's great. Um, so Torches and Pitchfork says I'm into blue oyster mushrooms. That's interesting. Um, I'll have to check that out. 
And uh, Joe says he buys the log seeded and just adds water. Yep. And that's why I want to try it. It is really simple. And I've got my basement where I do my grow room. And I think it should be really easy to set up a, a mushroom grow operation. So I think that would be really good. Jay's saying co-hosting could help other garden channel owners that you trust to win-win. Yeah, I like that idea. So I'm planning another vacation probably in the fall when things start slowing down a bit. And um, yeah, I, I think I might experiment with that. So I appreciate your support I'm, and, and your encouragement on that idea. Because I'm all about getting the information out. Yes, I love doing it. And I... I like to be the face on the Gardener Scott channel, but if it's a different face and you still get the information, it, that's a win-win for me too. I don't have to be here to be the one giving out the information. I just like to be the one that gives out the information. So so thank you for all that. I think that those are good ideas. We'll have to look into it. So good, lots of good information passing back and forth about the, the mushrooms. I appreciate that. I'll... Uh, I'll definitely go back. I'm, I'm seeing some of it as it scrolls through now, but I'll definitely go back and make notes of all of this. I think that's that's incredible. So expect to see more videos about mushrooms. That's great. So let's go ahead and get to that point of the show where we start talking about uh, the philosophy and how you can become a better gardener. And this one might surprise you this week, uh, but bear with me because I, I think I think it will literally bear fruit. So I want you, I encourage you, as you are planning your gardening season or planning a fall garden, whatever it happens to be, but plan to fail. Plan to grow something that you are sure is not going to be successful. Try a new way of gardening, container gardening, a new bed, Build something that you are just sure is not going to work in your environment. So, for instance, those of you that I know are in Michigan right now and it's frigid and you have a very short season, try growing okra. Okra is a classic southern United States plant that can be very difficult to grow. And that's exactly why you should grow it. So... Chances are, if you're growing in Michigan or Ontario, Canada, you're probably not growing a lot of okra. Do it because there is so much to be learned from failure that you can carry those lessons over into all the other plants that you do normally grow. So I've tried growing okra a few times in my Colorado Zone 5B garden. I've had minimal success, but I know what went wrong. I know why the okra didn't grow well. The first time it was because of the soil and because it didn't get enough sun. The second time was because I started it too late and I needed more sun and heat during my growing season. So I know why the okra didn't work in my garden. And I'm going to try it again this year to see if I can improve upon my own gardening techniques to maybe have some okra that I can harvest. And I've harvested okra from my garden, but it's been very small and it wasn't much of it because the plants didn't grow as well as they should have. But I'm trying it. And that's what I encourage you to do. Try something that won't work. If you're in zone eight or zone nine, grow strawberries. Strawberries do great in zones four, five, six, and seven, but it's a struggle to grow strawberries in zone eight and nine and 10. So try it because chances are you're going to fail. But during the process, as you're watching your plants wither away, now this is where the analysis of gardening comes into play. And I've been asked this question in recent weeks about growing strawberries in zone nine. And my suggestions have been maybe grow them in a microclimate where it's cool, try some shade. Well, that's, that's what I'm telling you to do. Don't just listen to me give you some suggestions on what might work. I'm saying do it. You're probably going to fail if you're in a zone nine and you want to grow strawberries. You probably are. But along the way, you're going to figure out why the strawberries failed. Probably the heat, 
probably the length of the season, probably the lack of the cold winter months. There's lots of reasons why strawberries will fail in zone nine. You need to learn those reasons so that when you're growing other plants that do well in your region, now you become that expert gardener. You become the gardener that can tweak your techniques you can tweak what you do to the soil. You can tweak what you do with shade cloth. You can tweak all of those gardening techniques that you've learned to get your normal plants to be superior and have outrageous harvests. It's by learning from the failures, learning from the mistakes, and learning about the plants and why some plant will do well in one garden and not in another garden. And more specifically, why a plant might do well in one part of your garden and not do well in another part of your garden. There are so many factors. Microclimates, the weather, chill hours, amount of sunlight in a day. All of those will influence how plants grow. And so when you start off by growing something that you know is not going to grow, every day that you can keep that plant alive is another lesson learned. And if you can keep it alive another week, oh, think of all those lessons that you've gained. And if you can actually keep it alive for the whole season and reach the point of harvest, you're just loaded with knowledge about that plant that you were sure wasn't going to live and you kept it alive. So this is one of those things that, you know, it's really thinking outside the box because most of us are only going to grow the plants we know will grow well because we don't like that dissatisfaction. We don't like that feeling that we killed a plant. But that t-shirt that you've seen in some of my videos that says, I kill plants so that others may thrive, this is one of the reasons that I have that t-shirt. I will intentionally grow plants that I know will struggle. And it's painful. It is painful to watch these plants struggle. But I'm learning through the whole process so that when I grow plants that maybe are tough to grow in my area, but will do okay, because I've learned from that plant that died, now I'm more likely to have success with those plants that would normally struggle. But now I know what to do to keep those plants growing and to make it to the harvest point. So stick that in your bag of tricks. Actually looking for failure so that you can learn from it. And that's one of the best ways many of us become expert gardeners as we learn from our failures but they're often failures we didn't see coming and we often can't learn all the lessons that need to be learned because we didn't see it coming this is an opportunity for you to see it coming to see that failure coming and now you can analyze it at every step of the process Put notes in your garden journal, make videos about it, share your stories with other gardeners, and then at the end of the season, you can look back and say, okay, I get it now. Next year, it's going to be even better because of what I learned this year. And that's where many of us are right now as we look forward to this next season. What are we going to do? What's it going to take to be successful? And I'm saying failure is often what it takes to be successful. So might as well do it on purpose and you don't feel so bad. So hope that helps. I know it's a little bit of a stretch, a little bit different than what we've talked about in recent weeks, but it's also one of those things that I think is an important way to approach gardening as well as life. Just accept the failure. And sometimes when it happens, because you know it's coming, it doesn't hurt as much. And you can really move to the next level when you encounter those type of things. So hope that helps. I'm looking forward to seeing you all back again in two weeks. Uh, I'll miss you, but I will set up that, uh, that I'm not here video and you're welcome to participate. There's also the, the private Facebook page. If, you, if you're a member of the Gardner Scott channel, if you've joined, you can participate at the Facebook page at any time as well. So I'll try to make it as easy as possible for you here and on Facebook in the next week 
to answer your questions and, and have others that are participating and answering your questions and showing your pictures and making your comments, all that wonderful stuff that we're doing. Thank you so much for being here. Mondays are just such a great time, especially when it's frozen outside and we have to be inside. I'd be, I'd rather be in no place than this one right here with you participating in the Gardener's Scott community. Thanks. I hope you have a great gardening week. I hope it warms up for you and I hope you can get lots of plants and seeds started. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.